A new book reopens the row over the controversial Gujarat massacres of 2002 and the so-called encounters or extrajudicial killings which took place in the state afterwards in which hundreds of Muslims were murdered. Based on secret recordings, the book points the finger of responsibility back at the then Chief Minister of Gujarat, now Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi, and his closest allies in the ruling BJP. The author, Rana Ayub, an investigative journalist, says she had to self-publish her book because no one mainstream would touch it. So is dissent being stifled in Modi's India and our world leaders desperate to do business in India turning a blind eye. To debate this I'm joined by Rana Ayub from New Delhi and here in the studio by Sadanan Dume, South Asia columnist for the Wall Street Journal and a resident fellow at the conservative think tank the American Enterprise Institute. Thanks both for joining me in the arena. Um, Rana Ayub your new book Gujarat Files Anatomy of a Cover-Up stormed straight into the Amazon bestseller list contains some rather remarkable revelations transcripts of secretly recorded conversations about the alleged links between between the Prime Minister and his allies and various instances of communal violence, extrajudicial killings, and yet you had to self-publish it. Why? I was undercover in the year 2010-2011 when Narendra Modi was the Chief Minister uh, of Gujarat and uh, this investigation was carried right after my, uh, one of my exposés landed the present BJP President Amit Shah behind bars. Um, I came back with the transcripts. Uh, my organization, who I worked with, refused to publish it, citing political pressure. You say your organization, Tahelka, which was the investigative magazine, they cited political pressures, you say. And yet they say yes. today that they didn't publish your stuff because it was incomplete, full of holes, did not meet the necessary editorial standards. What do you say to them? Well, the fact that the book is an international bestseller, it has got uh, it has got reviews from every possible publication, citing it as perhaps the best investigative work in the country in the last decade. I mean, uh, the fact that it has got great readership, not a single person who I had stung during the investigation has actually come forward to file a defamation against me or said that the information that I have written in the book is untrue. Okay. So I think that speaks Let's volumes for the authenticity and, and the content of the book. Uh, Okay, Sadan and Dume is here. Um, are critics of Modi, such as Rana Ayub, being prevented from getting their journalism out? Are there, is dissent being stifled? Are they being silenced? Uh, I don't think dissent is being stifled at all. I think the very fact that uh, Rana Ayub's book is a bestseller, the very fact that it has been very widely reviewed and discussed in India, uh, both in the print and on television, suggests otherwise. Now, I don't know the sort of publication history, but I think it may be a little presumptuous to presume that if your book isn't published, it can only be for a political motive. Uh, Sadhana, Human Rights Watch published a report in India in May called Stifling Dissent, in which it pointed out that the BJP government, quote, uses draconian laws to silence dissent, to silence their critics. Reporters Without Borders says the press freedom situation is worsening in India. Surely you would agree that, separate to the specifics of this book, there's a wider problem with dissent, with censorship, with media criticisms of this government. So I would divide that into two parts. Would I, that in general, I would say that India has a freedom of speech problem. Uh, it has a problem partly because of the laws. It has a problem where any side essentially, uh, especially on religious issues, if there's any kind of offense, uh, people react by using the law and clamping down. Do I think on the larger question that freedom of speech has fundamentally worsened over the past two years? My answer to that is no. Uh, Rana, you, what's your response to that? It's got worse. In 2014, soon after Narendra Modi came to power, I wrote a critical piece in DNA, uh, a very acclaimed newspaper. It was pulled down immediately after publication because the officials, uh, the, uh, the editors got a call from Amit Shah, who is the right-hand man of Narendra Modi, to pull down the article. Is this what we expect of journalism in this country? Is this not stifling of voices? Okay. Sadhana, do you want to respond? I mean, I think your viewers can figure out whether there's freedom of speech, whether there's, whether there's dissent, whether there's freedom to criticize Narendra Modi quite easily. All you need to do is go to a website and check out the Indian press. I read six Indian newspapers a day. I look at the op-ed pages. There's absolutely no shortage of criticism. Uh, is it true that on certain things, Prime Minister Modi could have spoken up more? Is he could have, could he be leading the battle for civil liberty in a more activist manner, of course. But that is very, very different from saying that there's no room to criticize him. India is not remotely like, say, Putin's Russia or Erdogan's Turkey. 
Rana Ayub, you went undercover for, I think, eight months in 2010-11 to do these quote-unquote stings on various Gujarat politicians, security officials, high-ranking police officers. I'm just wondering, has anyone from the authorities asked for your recordings, asked for your transcripts? Have you had to hand them over to anyone in power to, to build a new case against anyone in the BJP? On the day of my book launch, I, I made a public announcement that, you know, the, uh, the SIT, the investigating team which was investigating the Gujarat riots, uh, I would be more than happy to provide them the tapes and the transcripts provided they are showing the but willingness to you. investigate it in, in, in an independent You're happy to provide them. Manner. Have they asked you for Newspapers it? Newspapers have gone... No, they haven't okay. asked me. Sadanand, let me ask you this. Given so many Indians, the polls suggest a majority of Indians have no faith uh, in the fairness of the judiciary and the court system. Uh, the Supreme Court Justice, former Indian Supreme Court Justice, says is on record saying corruption in our courts is no secret. It is rampant. Given you have that situation and a lot of people in Gujarat, victims of violence, still waiting for justice, uh, you know, more than a decade later, isn't that why uh, you need someone like Rana Ayub to go and do the digging, the undercover journalists, the recordings, the stings? Because the judiciary is not getting justice for those victims in Gujarat. I think that you could easily argue that the courts need to have moved faster. Uh, there were a bunch of convictions recently in one of the worst incidents of that violence. So I don't think that any reasonable person yeah, the says... the foot soldiers, it's a classic case of the foot yeah. soldiers have been prosecuted, but the political masters, the people at no. the top, not really. Look, politicians deserve the same standards as anybody else. Now, there is a process. Either you believe that the process is fundamentally compromised, or you believe that the process may be imperfect, but is not fundamentally flawed. And I think that's where you and I are, are come, come down on different sides. Well, let me ask you about the politics of it before I go back to Rana. In 2005, the US government, the Bush administration, banned Narendra Modi from entering the country uh, because he was seen as responsible for, quote, severe violations of religious freedom during the Gujarat pogroms. Uh, in June of this year, Narendra Modi suddenly has the privilege of not just coming to the United States, but speaking in front of the US Congress and getting a, you know, standing ovations from US legislators. That's a pretty big change of fortunes that has nothing to do with, you know, led judicial decisions or the truth about the violence. It's because no, he's I the prime minister I now. I think you're wrong. I think it has, I think you're, I think it is largely to do with the fact that he is the prime minister of India. But I think that there was a very large role in the normalization of the West with Narendra Modi even before he became prime minister. Because they thought he was going to win. No, was and the they want to do business no, with India. Was, an, uh, was the SIT report? So in 2012, there was an SIT report, the investigative team of exactly, the Supreme Court, appointed by the Supreme Court, which said we do not have evidence to prosecute him. In although, although an amicus curiae, friend sure. of the court, said there was evidence. In 2013, there was a court judgment that essentially endorsed what that SIT report, which had been mandated by the Supreme Court, said. I think that opened the door. It's certainly true that if Narendra Modi had lost the election terribly in 2014, things would be different. Uh, Rana, you, what's your response to that? There is no clean shit which has yet been given to Narendra Modi. In fact, the crux of what most officials in this book, um, you know, uh, tell me is the fact that most of them lied to the SIT. Most of them did not dare to speak to the SIT because they, uh, they feared the consequences. The Home Secretary to the Gujarat government, Ashok Narayan, who was grilled by the same SIT which allegedly gave Modi a clean shit, tells me in this book that it was Modi who was responsible, who benefited um, because of the consequences of the riots, because he built an image, he gave a free hand to the rioters. He was not just inefficient as Chief Minister during the Gujarat riot, but, was com but what comes out of this book is that Narendra Modi was complicit for his role in the Gujarat okay. riots and the fake encounters. Okay, Sadan, and you've read the book. Do you agree? Do you believe the evidence is there? Does I it bother you? I question the credibility of Rana, partly because of the method. Even if she's partly, got tapes, partly, which she's willing to hand over to the not, police. Which she has not released. Okay. She still hasn't released them. So what we have is a transcripts of let me remind six you, year Southern and, old Southern, let me remind, interviews let where, me, the tr where the tapes have not been released. And I just actually that's a great question. I would love her to release Rana, them. Do you want to respond? Uh, Sutherland, I think you are mistaken here. I mean, when you're talking about sting investigation not being taken and uh, not being credible enough, let me tell you that one of the convictions in the in, in the Gujarat riots happened uh, 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 happened because of a sting operation that was conducted in 2007 by the same organization that I used to work with, and the judge and the so judge who gave the verdict your, cited the tapes, heavily Rana. from the sting operation. Rana, why don't so you I think why don't you do the simple thing and put the tapes up on a website? What is stopping you from doing that? Isn't that a pretty obvious thing to do? 
I have approached every possible news channel in this country, every possible news publication, every possible website in the last five years to publish these okay, tapes. So I do not have a lawyer. Tomorrow, if I publish this, I can be tapes? arrested for various the, charges. You, hold on, do you have any uh, plans I mean, it's to put easier, the tapes up? It's easier sitting there in D.C. and talking about giving... Uh, Rana, do you have any plans to put the tapes up? I'm going to put the tapes up the moment the, the moment the government ensures my safety and the fact that it, this, these tapes will be looked in an independent manner by the special investigations team. Uh, thank you both for joining me. We're out of time. Uh, appreciate you all coming into the arena. That's our show. Up front, we'll be back next week.